Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Christian Meerman, founding partner at Cherry Ventures. Before that, I was an entrepreneur, a CMO at Zalando. Uh, and after that, we started Cherry. Before that, I was at BCG. And that's where I met Jochen back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. Hi, also, um, from my side, welcome, everybody. Um, great to be here again. Always a fantastic atmosphere in Helsinki at Slush. Um, so great to share this panel. Yeah. So look, we are here today on the impact stage. And I think one of the things you need to have impact is scale, right? Otherwise, it's very hard kind of as a seed stage company to have immediate impact. And if we look at Flix, um, you have a very decent size. Uh, it's a company of more than two billion revenues, profitable, took also uh, more than two years to get there, um, but it's an amazing journey. And now, kind of with that scale, I think you can have very high impact, uh, both from a sustainability side, from a social side, and, and a bunch of other dimensions. Before we go into that, on kind of how you build a, a global champion, let's maybe start a little bit from the beginning, like how did you start back in the day? Why mobility? Why bus travel? And then who did you raise from for your first money? Yeah. I mean, we started on something that's unusual for Europe, as at least it feels unusual these days. So um, the German government has actually deregulated the market. So for a very long time, it was not allowed to run bus services between cities. They eventually changed this. And we saw this opportunity and felt this is where you can build something that's on the one hand a real product that you can touch and feel, and on the other hand, where we add value with building the platform, the brand, the technology around it, and we felt this, ex this opportunity doesn't come all that often, and it's so exciting that we felt, hey, let's just go and do it, and, and launch it, or try to build a business out of it. And um, our trigger was, if we don't do this, and someone else does it, and this works, and we've seen this early enough, then we'll probably regret it and hate ourselves for the rest of our lives. So we said, hey, let's just go and jump um, and do it. And uh, that's, that's kind of how we got here. Um, and I said at the beginning, it was just the three of us. We didn't have all that much. had no clue about the industry. Like, we weren't in logistics or bus or travel or tourism or anything before. As he said, we met in consulting. <laughs> that's, that was my first job after university. Um, and, and then got, tried to get investors from two worlds um, join with us. One is actually had um, people to invest cash into us to help us build the technology and build the platform. One of, one of that early believers um, were, were you and, and the early sort of stages of, of Cherry um, and a few other guys that we've, we felt that could add value from. So we raised first money from angels, also tried to be strategic where we don't really had a lot of clue about it and been naive as many um, at the very beginning, um, but tried to get someone who understands marketing, that was Christian, um, someone had has some sort of an industry background, had a guy from a large train company and, and bus operator, um, and then also needed bus partners to invest with us in terms of they would fund the buses, um, employ the drivers, and sort of invest into the capex that we needed for our business because we don't operate um, the assets ourselves but do this with partners. So they are investors in a sense too, and we had to persuade all of them and ultimately bring this all together to be able to launch, and that we eventually managed to launch in February 2013, so a long time ago, meanwhile. Yeah. And let's double click a little bit kind of on that journey, right? So you started off in Germany, <clears throat> then kind of expanded to other European countries, and then in the end kind of uh, went global. Um, yeah. And uh, at some point you acquired the most iconic bus brand in the US, Greyhound. But let's talk about that a little bit later. Like, how did you raise also so much money to get there? Uh, what was the secret? And because otherwise, you would have never gotten to scale. Like, yeah. how did you do that? Yeah. I mean, we actually, we've been pretty, pretty frugal at the very beginning. So we launched the business with a little over a million euros that we raised back then. Then we launched it and built it over the first few weeks and months. And then, as this, our market has got so much media attention, we also got investor attention. So they actually um, knocked on our door, say, hey, let's talk, um, and eventually, um, got more people excited about what we were doing because you could see early traction. There was customers using it. We could sort of show growth, um, a growth curve, and people believing or buying the product in that sense. I um, mean, that sort of may got investors excited. So you need to show some early traction. Um, then raise the first institutional round back then, um, and try to use again. Be very frugal with that money. Try to show unit economics early on. Make 
also our growth not like overly cash burning in that sense. So always try to strike a balance between growth and profitability. We've been far away from profitability back then, but always felt like you need to show a core of your business that works. Like the first line, the second line that works, where unit economies pick up and you can show that it actually works. And also marketing spend makes sense in terms of relative to your um, revenues. And so this worked. And then we've actually, we always had this vision of, you will only survive in this market and build something that's sustainable for the long term if you're the biggest, the sort of have the best inventory, are most well known, have most efficiencies and synergies on the marketing side. So our big belief was we need to be the biggest. So we were like running fast at the beginning to put more buses on the street, build inventory, build more lines, connect more cities. And apart from us, nobody else was that aggressive. And I think this differentiated us from all the rest of, in our market and all the competition to have this clear idea of what we believe this market needs to be one after all. And I think this is also what drove us to um, ultimately scale out of Germany. And in our case, internationalizing is very easy at the beginning because you can just connect the city in another country to Germany in that sense. So we went to Paris, to Vienna, to Zurich, to Prague, to um, the Nordics and, um, and connected this to our home market. But then built domestic businesses is the more difficult part. And this is where I think you need to be also growing up as an organization to hire the right people and also hire entrepreneurial talent in those countries to give them the freedom and independence and empowerment to say, this is your country, we give you all the tools, the technology, the infrastructure, all the push and support from headquarters, but you need to build this. Um, and I think this is something that, in hindsight, we got right to get the right people on board and, and also have local entrepreneurs who are like, I own France, I build France, I own Italy, I will build this. And I really passionate about their country, their local mission, and their local entrepreneurial journey. I mean, I think this is what, we, what we've made work, ultimately, and what helped us then, then grow internationally. Yeah, cool. And if we look at your consumers, uh, I mean, you have millions uh, of customers every year. So how has that changed over time? I mean, sustainability has become more and more important, so yeah. people care about how do they travel from A to B. What does that do kind of with your product, with your requirements? Can you see a different behavior in consumers? Yeah. I would, I would say there, there is a mind shift happening. And like, I think also if you look at Scandinavia where we're these days, I think electric mobility is much more advanced than it is in most other places. Um, what we've seen though is at the beginning in the earlier years, people said, yeah, we look for sustainable mobility, but we're not really willing to pay for it. And you could, you could tell from, we had a little checkbox in our um, booking process to say you want to offset your trip and it's a few cents, 20 cents to 70, 80 cents or so. It's relatively cheap depending on the trip distance and only a small fraction of our customers actually ticked that box and paid that additional money. So you could tell that people claim to be um, focused on the environment and sustainability but ultimately if it's um, how much do you pay for it, yeah. this actually changes your mind. And I think this, is, this has changed over time so that proportion is much higher these days I think the people make more conscious choices around what do I consume, which products do I consume, and also which brands do I like. And this is, I think, also something that we've managed to, and not, not by coincidence, but we're green as a brand, and we also position ourselves as this is sustainable mobility um, like versus any other alternative. You'll, you'll have the better choice with us. It's more sustainable to be on a 50, 70, or 70, 80 seat bus versus your own car, obviously against flights, but in most countries, um, also even against trains. Um, so it's just the most sustainable version to travel. Um, and, and I think this, this increasingly plays a role in which product do I buy and also which brands am I loyal towards. And just like with any consumer business, it's about a customer and brand loyalty long term. So you need to acquire them once, but you, you want to make sure they stay with you. And customer acquisition with aggressive marketing or low price at the beginning is the easier part. The more difficult part is really how do you build a long term loyal customer base that's loyal to your brand. Um, where you hopefully then not have to reacquire those customers over and over again and spend too much money on marketing. Absolutely, yeah. And um, if you look at your journey, like scaling also into so many different countries with different regulatory frameworks that you were facing, like what have you learned from that and what yeah. do you think is kind of important for founders that work in regulated markets? Yeah, I, I guess first, do not take regulation as an excuse to not build a business. I think w if, if this is the case, then you should just not build, be in that business and be an entrepreneur there. So don't take this as an excuse. And at the same time, I think our mindset has always been, hey, our market is regulated, we just need to work with it. And we need to be 
friendly with regulators, friendly with authorities, try to partner with them, help them with their job, make their lives easy to get across those barriers they put in place with the regulation. Um, of course, we've been trying to change regulation to our favor a lot. And uh, until today, for example, Spain domestically still regulated, so we can't operate domestic lines. So we're working on that on a Spanish level, on EU level. It's a multi-year project. It goes on and on and doesn't really change. But um, this is, it is what it is. At the same time, our mindset has been, if we crack all those countries, and if you do this in Europe, in the regula regulatory framework, and you've, uh, you have managed to overcome those obstacles, and it is hard for us, it's going to be at least as hard, if not harder, for anybody else. So you actually build something that's defendable. You build a moat if you crack regulation in any given market. Um, and it's really difficult to attack us in our market position once you've done that. At the same time, I would say, if we now look at expansion markets, we, regulation and the regulatory framework is one of the prime characteristics that we look at in terms of identifying which markets are we going next. And there's a few places that are just impossible for us to enter because regulatory framework is just so bad that it doesn't make sense. So there's no real access. So we'd rather put this aside and there's so much other stuff to do. We focus on those markets where there's liberal access. We don't have all those high barriers, but can really freely develop our product. Um, and that usually makes it easier. That's also why the US was a good market for us. Um, and, and that's also how we prioritize on where we expand and where we invest our money. And if we zoom out a little bit now, and if you think at kind of the European tech level, what could policymakers do to foster entrepreneurship and make it easier for companies to scale so that you don't have to spend so much time in interviews and talking to politicians and regulators and, and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, we only have a, f a few minutes here, so this is <coughs> going to be very long. Um, I'm sorry, but no, I mean, overall, I think it's no secret that Europe is heavily regulated, and I think um, governments and politicians have been overdoing it over the past few years. And um, I hope people are waking up latest with what happens around AI these days. And, and I think we're already falling behind. And you can see this on your iPhones, where you don't have the functionality that the US and other countries are having. I mean, it's a nightmare. And it's actually, it's pathetic for Europe, period. Um, and, and they need to wake up. And also, I think we as a startup ecosystem, as investors, as entrepreneurs, need to push politicians and need to explain it to them, because mostly they don't understand actually what they're regulating. And this is the real issue. So you need to explain it, and you also need to spend the time explaining why this regulation doesn't make sense and what the benefit is of deregulating. And I think people increasingly, like if you do spend the time, people do get it. And ultimately, um, they understand that they need to be friendly and open for business and open for the economy to make this work. Yeah. Um, so I think we all, as, a, as an ecosystem, need to spend and invest this time to explain it. And then I'm positive that even the EU and, and um, European regulators will get it, that we need to sort of be more open. And it's okay to regulate, that's fine, but um, you need to uh, first sort of at least give people and businesses a chance to build businesses that work before you regulate too heavily. Um, and I think at the moment we do this vice versa, unfortunately. We regulate first and then try to be a bit more lax over time, and that's the right approach at this point. Yeah. And if you look in the future now, like what is... What do you think are going to be fundamental breakthrough technologies that are going to change the world and then how people move, right? So is everyone going to fly with their own autonomous yeah. little plane from A to B in the future and no buses are needed anymore? Like, how, how do you look at this? Yeah, I, I do hope and I do think that buses and also our trains will be needed very long term. No, I think... I mean, for, for us in particular, and I'm, I'm not going to go into how is AI going to change the world, but like for our market, there's a few specific technology developments that are relevant. It's certainly electrification. This will just happen, period. There will be advancements on battery ranges and stuff. So maybe not the next generation battery, but like two generations from now, I think we will have enough range to also put this at scale into our buses. Um, so this will happen. Autonomous is certainly a theme that's been there for a long time. We just yep. discussed backstage that the hype has been there a few years ago already. And now it's like that phase where people get back to reality and it's still slowly um, happening. Um, so there was this phase where autonomous was only three or five years away, and this took for like 10 years, um, so a long time, but I think it's coming. Um, and for us, in the end, what it does, it helps people to not have to own cars and like uh, those assets themselves. So mobility is going to be available as a service, and I think this is a massive advantage for us, that people can not only rely in cities on public transportation, short distance mobility, etc., but also on long distance, you're not going to need your car. You can rely on us, you can rely on any other public services, long distance trains, also flights to some extent. Um, and because you mentioned um, sort of smaller planes and stuff, I would love to see this 
this vision and this, these, those products come true. So electric, smaller flies that you can use for also shorter distances or like more sort of um, focused um, things. I'd love this to come true. I have a hard time seeing that this actually scales to the amount of people that are willing, that want to travel. And just to give you an example, um, we just launched India a few months ago. There's every single day, there's a wait list for train tickets that's like a seven-digit number of people. It's just impo I, impossible for me to imagine how you scale this in small planes that people can travel where they want. Right. I think you need large vehicles. If you look at our buses, that's 50, 70, 80 seats in, uh, in, in some cases. The trains that we're scaling now is like 800 to 1,000 seats. So this is really mobility at scale. And I think this is what you need. And that's also going to be there in a few decades from now. I think we should all embrace those new technologies and we should embrace innovation around technology, but we should also, because we talk about impact at scale, try to be sustainable what, what we ha with what we have today and just scale f as fast as we can the solutions that we have. And I mean, if you look at energy um, generation these days, just said about um, fusion power, and I, I, this technology is fascinating and I hope we'll solve this from an engineering technology point of view as soon as we can, but for now, Let's just build as much solar and wind as we can and as fast as we can to solve the problem that we have at hand. And I think this is also how we think about mobility. And we as a company, we're positioned to use whatever mean of mobility may be out there and we'll just put it on our platform and we'll sell it because we have distribution, we have brand, we have marketing, we have everything there. That's fine. These days we have buses and trains and this scales. This is what we do best and that's why we scale it and we continue to have impact at scale. Yeah, good. And how do you think about the, the crazy stuff out there? Right? It's a Hyperloop, yeah. all these little autonomous planes. Like, what do you think it takes kind of to get there? Or will we ever get there? Actually? <laughs> I, I hope we do get there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's enough indication, there's enough evidence that we should be optimistic about those technologies coming into, um, into the real world. Um, I don't know if, again, Hyperloop or like EV tolls or something is something that will be available at scale for everybody at your fingertip and you can just use it as a taxi. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, but again, it's like with Fusion. Of course, we should experiment with it. We should push technology. There should be investment going into this because this is what also humanity has advanced over the past 100 or 200 or hundreds of years to really push the boundaries. And I think we should continue to do that. Um, which one of those is going to be first and which one is going to be at scale at some point, I can't tell. I, yeah. I really don't know. I just think that, as I said, it's very hard to scale something against existing infrastructure. And existing infrastructure, unfortunately, is, is roads, is rail tracks, is airports. That's there. And whatever you can scale on top of this infrastructure is so much easier to put into life and put into implementation and put at scale. Um, so I think those, the models that are able to somehow combine and use existing infrastructure will be the ones that win. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that it's going to take billions kind yeah. of, to try it out, and then you know if it actually works. Okay. If you look at the more kind of recent or relevant technologies that you guys are using, like EVs, and like, where does that stand? Like, can you already yeah. integrate electric buses into the fleet, or is there an issue with reach? Like, what are the yeah. shortcomings? Yeah. And yeah. What is working already? No, no, we've been. Exp I, I, I'm afraid I have to say experimenting with electric buses for many years already. Um, we, we keep pushing the OEMs. We keep also pushing our partners to try it out because ultimately it's not us owning those assets and owning those buses and also we don't have to operate them in like real, real life. Um, so we keep pushing it. At this stage, the range of the batteries in the buses is just not sufficient to do this at scale with like 80, 90 or 100 percent of our fleet. Um, so we do this selectively where we have shuttle services that do two, three hundred kilometers and we, we know we have charging points and you can sort of schedule charging events and stuff. So we do this. We're also experimenting with biogas um, instead of regular fuels, etc. So there's lots of stuff that you can do to bring your footprint, down, so your carbon footprint down um, already these days. And I said, we try to set lighthouse examples, create early experiences, real operational experience in running this. And then I think the good thing, good thing for us is once the technology is a bit further. It's not that far, actually. Like, battery ranges continue to develop very quickly. And once this is there, and it's actually an economic case that makes sense for us in terms of um, total cost of ownership in the operations, it's very quick for us to exchange the fleet over only a few years. And then you can completely transform this from regular combustion engines into electric. Um, so it's actually it's in reach, um, and we keep pushing it. It's not there yet. And again, also sustainable technology needs to be a business case in the end. And I think this is... This is what also any founder needs to have it in the back of their head of, we need to make this work at scale at a price that makes economic sense. And I think, as I said, we keep pushing with OEMs, with suppliers, with partners, 
with governments, with regulators, and just mentioned India. India is at the forefront of pushing electrification into fleets, especially also on buses. And again, we try to cooperate with all the different stakeholders to make this work and, and make this happen. Yeah. Okay, understood. So EVs getting there. Yeah. Let's say autonomous driving, right? So if you go yeah. to San Francisco, you sit in a Waymo, it, you know, it works. Yeah. Uh, when are we going to board the Flix bus and there's suddenly no driver left? When have you boarded a plane with no pilot in it? Okay. So technically it's possible yeah. today, right? You don't need the pilot really to fly and, and I don't know if there's any pilots in the audience who would disagree, <laughs> but technically you don't. Um, it's a, it's, there's lots of psychology behind it and I think, again, there we'll see a stepwise approach of... I mean, for us it would already be a game changer if we could do the, the, regular, the regulated pauses that our drivers need to make while they're driving. So let's just assume he takes the first half an hour or so from the terminal to the highway, and then there's another hour where he can just relax and take his break, um, and autonomous is taking over for a certain period, and then he goes back once we enter the city and there's more complicated driving situations, etc. This would be a game changer for us already, and I think we're, we're sort of slowly getting there from full driver to some remote phase, remote driving phase potentially, um, to some autonomous phase, to more and more autonomous over time. And for us, this is a massive ga game changer, not only from a, the driver, obviously, is also a cost factor for us, but there's such a massive shortage of drivers for trucks and buses globally that whatever we can take away in terms of the need of driver hours that we have in our network um, is going to be a massive um, lever for us. So, we, again, we're embracing the technology, but it's a a way to get there over the next few years. Yeah. And since you're operating on a global scale, what do you think in which market that's going to be possible as a, as a first one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at the weather um, today out there, you can tell that this is going to be a much more complicated situation for any autonomous vehicle versus Arizona or California, where yeah. most of those fleets actually operate today. Yeah. Um, so, so not Finland, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so weather and like overall environmental conditions is one thing, but the more important one is really regulation again. Um, and I think other countries are just more progressive on allowing those things to happen um, than, than most European countries are. Um, so I think from a regulatory point of view, it's going to be those countries that are more progressive to just allow this to happen and just try it out. Um, and I, I see other places, unfortunately, again, than Europe to do this. For us, it doesn't really matter all that much because we're in 44 countries now and we just pick those where it's, it's possible and just test it, this out, out first. And then, we, again, we can have a proof point of, hey, this works in the US. This is the proof points, this is the data, this is the security statistics, whatever. Let's just copy-paste this to Europe and just do this country by country and roll it out here. Yeah, great. Uh, we're coming to an end. Uh, let's look at the future for Flix. Like, what do you have in terms of exciting sustainability initiatives um, that are coming up, that are in the pipeline that you're working on? Yeah. I mean, f for us, the, the big lever around sustainability, and this is, of course, there's always hundreds and thousands of things you can do, but for us, and this has always been a key for us also for long-term success, is to be very focused. And for us, the big lever is getting as many people into our buses and trains as possible. This creates impact for us at scale. And then also, as just said, it's the decarbonization of our fleet operations. So the more and the earlier we can get into electric um, engines or into alternative fuels, be it biogas or any other solution, the better. And this is what we're pushing on. And this is where we spend 98% of our time and money um, in terms of how can we create impact. And that's also where we focus our, our team on. Of course, we do corporate stuff around how do we, I mean, the, the, the random stuff. Where, where do we buy our energy? There's renewable energy also for our trains. How do we, which kind of products are we using in our offices, etc. Of course, we do this, but like the really big impact is um, getting as many people to switch from your own car into our products and um, decarbonizing of our fleet operations. And what is the best way to organize that internally within the firm? Do you have kind of sub-teams, one only focuses on green energy, the other one on convincing everyone in the world to use a bus, or how yeah. do you structure that? Yeah. I mean, getting more people onto our buses is the core of our mission, so the, the entire company works on that, so that's yeah. an easy one. Um, on the, on the fleet side, we actually, um, we, we've also integrated this in our strategy, built scientifically, scientific based targets on how, when and how do we get to a decarbonization on the fleet, what are the steps to get there, and we have a dedicated team to continue to be very close on the OEMs, technology developments, who is ultimately also managing those um, pilot projects to help us with building experience, etc. Um, so we have a team, which is an investment for us, obviously, to put people on that topic. 
and, and those guys are driving also all the stakeholder management within our organization, but also with all the external guys um, to ultimately achieve our targets, decarbonizing what we do entirely. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Jochen. I think cool. that was uh, very insightful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy Slush. Cheers. <laughs>